The words read, please stay on the trails. Mother Nature was in the process of reclaiming her territory and had faded the bright yellow text carved onto the sign to a deep earthly brown. I once more looked into my backpack, making sure I had the necessaries. Water bottle, check. Bug spray, check. Granola bars, check. Lastly, my sandwich. I planned to devour it as soon as I got to the top of the hill. Yet, even after a big breakfast, my stomach whined and I shut it up with one of my granola bars. The mystic and allure of these enormous redwood trees can't quite be put into words. It's something that needs to be felt and experienced on your own. The enormous canopies that shoot up into the sky and gargantuous trunks that make my truck look like a Hot Wheels toy are sights to behold and truly meant to be taken in with your own senses. I hiked throughout these trails often and eventually it passed along by word of mouth through my local hiking group that the tallest tree on earth was located right here in North California. Naturally, my interest peaked at the thought of catching a glimpse of the world's tallest tree. The location wasn't listed officially for fear of tourists damaging the site to which it belonged to. Understandably, but though the national parks tried to keep its location unlisted, I was able to find a website that provided a map on how to find it. Its discoverer named it the Hyperion Tree. Soon enough, I was on my way to the state park. The gravel path I started on transformed into hard packed dirt, the kind that rattles the bones if you step too hard. As I wandered down the path, it came to me that it would be much more difficult than I anticipated to tell Hyperion apart from the rest of the foliage around it. I would have to go by the photo references I had saved on my phone. You would think the tallest tree on earth would stick out like a sore thumb, but I feared the tree would be well concealed amongst the rest of its family members. The trail began sloping down towards a creek that bubbled calmly. It being the middle of summer, most of the flow had slowed lazily and provided the opportunity to cross safely. I pulled out a print out of the map and referenced where to cross the stream. I began removing my boots and socks, but as I rolled up my pants, I noticed, or rather felt, a presence across the creek. A laugh was heard far across the creek. <laughs> Even with the sound of the stream, it was distinct enough to tell it apart from the rest of the ambient. I couldn't see anything, but instead heard a small chuckle. It was a joyous laugh, but cut itself early, as if it was a theatre-goer, who was the only one who understood a high-browed joke in a crowd of people. Perhaps someone else had seen the same shortcut I had, which angered me slightly, knowing that there was already a human presence that beat me there. A flash of a greyish mass moving rather quickly for such a steep slope through the trees only confirmed this theory for me. I wasn't going to miss seeing Hyperion because someone else spoiled my discovery. After all, the location was listed on an easily accessible website. I crossed and the water cooled me as it flowed through my toes, the perfect alleviation from the sweat and stickiness that was starting to soak my pits and lower back. I didn't even bother drying my feet when I came to the opposite bank. Comparing my surroundings with the map, there was a small ravine leading up to a steep hill, and supposedly at the top would be the tree. A drink of water and then up the ravine, my tongue swelled with water again, revived. That part of my body was always the first to react to strenuous conditions. No trails or clear markings provided me an easy, recognisable way up 
Each step on the roots and uneven rocks beat and bruised my feet. This wasn't going to be easy. But it never was the few times I decided to step off the trail. My feet and legs would demonstrate their gratitude in the morning. The ground twisted upwards and the tree branches began blocking out more and more of the light. A subtle realisation hit me. The chirpings of the birds and cicadas were fading away the further I got from the creek. Was there some strange invisible barrier blocking tiny creatures from accessing the hill? I paused to take another drink from my carton, and out of the corner of my ear, I thought I heard a giggle. <laughs> a deep voice giggling, trying to contain itself as best it could. I called out ahead for whoever it might be. Hello? There couldn't be someone else giggling out there. But if it was another hiker pulling a prank, or some local trying to scare me off, it was working. I was close now to the top, and I was damned if I was going to let them spook me away. I carried on. The trees were closing in on each other, even further. The trunks of the redwoods formed rows like soldiers, standing at attention, barely letting me pass. I was squeezing my already sore body through the natural cracks. At last, I was at the summit, confirmed by the fact I knew I was looking straight at the monstrous tree. My worries about being able to identify the tree earlier was for naught. My sweaty, bug-bitten face grinned at the tree. Being up close to it, you could admire how powerful and wide it was. The stump could fit an entire school choir on it. My neck began aching from how often I glared up to appreciate its massive size. A perfect place to rest and refuel with the food that I brought. I wondered what this tree had been through, marvelling at each and every scar on its trunk. They told a story. I envied it almost. Being able to stand the test of time and emerge victorious on the other side. A naive thought. I knew better. Eventually, even Hyperion would crack in various places and collapse. Maybe the next year or 200 years from now, a fatal disease would cause most of the trunk to rot away and it would become weaker. Perhaps a severe thunderstorm would hit the area and the tree's height would work against it causing it to become top-heavy and finally collapsing with a boom like a tank shell going off right next to you, rattling you to the very core. I sat there eating my sandwich, marvelling at the tree, admiring the silence, the ambience, the serenity, when a shock ran through me, like something invisible ran through my body, grabbing all the peaceful thoughts and replacing them with hateful ones. A thought of finally telling your overly chatty co-worker to shut their fucking mouth and to leave you alone. A thought of throwing a glass at the bartender's head who said you're too drunk for another one. A thought of catching up to the person who cut you off in traffic, dragging them out of their car, taking a baseball bat to their back of their fucking head. <sighs> a breath, and I finally came back to my surroundings. I felt violated. Something grander than I took all my feelings and thoughts inside me and replaced them with vile, violent thoughts. For what seems like a brief moment, I had the courage to kill anything that stood in my way for whatever reason. I was filled with animalistic rage. I couldn't sit another moment there. I noticed that a few rays of sun that were poking through the branches became a deep gold. It was getting late. Time had blew by me. I looked at my phone and somehow several hours had passed by since I sat down. 
I couldn't take the obligatory social media photo of the tree. I wanted to go home and slink down into a ball. I was nauseous. The entire time up there, I couldn't shake the feeling that there was another presence with me. And it grew stronger after the hateful thoughts had passed me. That's when I saw him. It. Not even peering around the tree fully. That horrible fight flight response kicked in and the ancient feeling of cold chills running through you as if your heart decides to pump ice water instead of blood through your veins and your face tightens, draws your eyes wide open. My tongue shriveled and went numb. A cold grey face appeared from behind the tree about 20 feet in front of me. It was unmoving. It took no precautions to try and hide itself from me. It, or I don't know, knew that I was staring right at it, its appearance in my head as clear as the water I waded through downhill. Its eyes looked like a normal person's, but sunken deep into its head. There were enormous bags under and above the eyes, which were blood red. A few long, pure grey hairs trailed off of the otherwise bald head, a kind of that of a mad scientist. The hand curled around the edge of the tree, and long, vine-like fingers with broken and chipped nails twisted around the bark in anticipation of something. I wouldn't allow myself to ponder. I could barely swallow for how tight my throat was. My gut knew that this thing was not human. We stood staring at each other for what seemed like an hour, and I finally willed my left leg to unfreeze its aching nerves, and it took one step back, not daring to take my eyes off it or even blink. The thing's fingers started scratching at the bark, faster, perhaps in excitement, and beginning to quickly gasp. In short bursts. A cough followed, then a short, throaty chuckle. I felt a large bead of sweat trickle down the side of my head. Its laugh grew louder. The sound pierced right through me, only magnified by the fact that we were enveloped in utter silence. I picked up the pace, still not letting it out of my sight. Walking backwards down a steep hill proved just as difficult as it sounds, and gravity turned against me. I tried to grab a nearby branch to stop myself from falling, but it gave way, and I fell backwards and somersaulted. I was briefly stunned when my head hit the ground, but as my vision became clear again, a quick, scuttling sound piercing the dirt and then the rock. I never want to hear something like that again. I saw it looking at me from behind a small ledge, now out loud chuckling at me, <laughs> its eyes wild with excitement. I was looking at a hellish version of the Kilroy was here drawing. They say that all humans have the ancient reptilian response of snapping you out of dangerous situations when you're too scared to move. I can't remember if it felt like time fast forwards because of the fight response or if I was losing my grip on reality through the sheer madness of this experience. I don't remember getting up and bolting it down the hill, but I remember my legs hammering the ground, torso being whipped by branches, and my face being cut by branches. A blare of brown and green whistled by me until I tripped into the creek, the water soaking into my shirt and pack, my left shoulder warm and throbbing. The laugh never grew in distance, it was always right behind me. It knew that it could lunge at me at any point that it wanted to, and it knew that I knew that too. I charged through the water, soaking the rest of my clothes in turn, and he weighing me down more. My adrenaline pushed me further still, and my legs burned and ached. The laugh paused behind me, I thought, but I didn't dare turn around.
I flew down the rest of the trail, not stopping until I got into my car. I reached up to my left shoulder and pulled a palmful of blood away. Then I pulled out of the car park, knowing I would never return to that park again. Hiking still holds a place in my heart. I go out as often as I used to. I love being in nature. I know that will never change. I'm more wary, obviously. I should be anyways. I was forced to always have that traumatising memory attached to what should have been a beautiful one. That day, after getting home, I assessed my shoulder in the mirror and spotted three long claw marks I had pierced through my shirt and reached up and over my back. A ghoulish souvenir that will never leave me. I don't go to that trail anymore. Hell, I don't even go to that same park anymore. I never told my hiking group what happened that day. They always act concerned when I refuse to go onto the trails out in that park. Yet sometimes, even when we're in a different park, after the group has paused for a water break, I get that sinking, chilling feeling again. That ancient response, ice water pumping through my heart. Some of the members of my hiking group stop and give me strange looks and ask if I'm okay. When out of the corner of my ear, I hear a soft <laughs> giggle and the sound of nails being dragged along tree bark. <laughs>